I'm going to take us all off here. Good evening, everyone. I am glad you were able to join us tonight. We have an exciting guest tonight, um, Mark Jinks. Um, he's a wonderful local uh, photographer and I've admired his work for a lot of years. Um, we also have um, Jim um, from NICI uh, USA on with us tonight. Um, he'll be joining us after Mark's broadcast uh, to tell us a little bit more about the filters themselves. And um, I'd like to introduce you to Mark. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks. Hi, Shauna. And hi, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining tonight. I know it's a, a beautiful summer evening out there in, in Edmonton. We don't don't really get a whole lot of summer. So thanks for uh, for taking the time and sacrificing a summer evening to, to watch this uh, presentation. Well, I'll let uh, you take the floor, uh, Mark, and I hope everyone enjoys uh, on the presentation tonight and feel free to ask questions after the presentation we'll have a q a and uh, have jim on as well if you guys have also got any questions regarding nisi filters so um i look forward to seeing everyone later and the show is all yours mark great thanks shauna all right so i'm just going to share my screen here it might take a second or two for the presentation to load up All right, so landscape photography and setting yourself apart. So uh, big thanks again to McBain Camera and Nisi Filters for having me on for this evening's presentation and for everyone for joining. Um, so a reminder that this, this event is fully live. Uh, anything can happen. So hopefully we don't run into any technical glitches, but I'm sure we won't. Um, so I'm just going to go over some techniques that I use in landscape photography to create some unique images. And I hope that there might be a tip in here or two that will help help you or inspire you. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I guess I'd consider myself a bit of an outdoor photography generalist. Um, I love pretty much anything out in, found out in nature. Um, I just find it so important for my mental health and just for recharging. Um, so from the silence of astrophotography under the stars to the power of severe weather to the spectacle of wildlife, I, I simply enjoy capturing these moments and sharing them with others. Um, I'm mostly self-taught. I found the best way that I learned was just be hanging around others, hanging out with other photographer, photographers, sharing skill sets and information, um, learning from others, taking some workshops, being inspired by others, um, spending a little bit of time watching tutorials each week, whether it's on, on YouTube or other platforms. Um, and I've had a chance to work with, uh, with Nisi since 2017. Um, I've worked a bit with Nikon for the last few years. Um, I've, I've had some, some work published in some different magazines, um, so I've been really fortunate in that regard. All right, so I'm going to go over a few ways to set yourself apart um, just by some different techniques. So I think landscape photography generally has this kind of stereotype of these ultra wide angle scenes, you know, like these grand vistas. Um, so there's a few ways I like to mix things up a little bit in my landscape photography. So you might know some of these already, but I'm hoping there might be a tip or two in here that, that might help you out. Um, so of course, keeping in mind that photography is expressive and subjective. So really it's ultimately up to you how you want to portray a scene. All right, so this is some of the gear I use and, and, and gear isn't necessarily as important as you would think. Um, so I have both uh, a mirrorless and a DSLR. I did go over to mirrorless a couple of years ago. I really enjoy it and I tend to use that most often for my landscapes now. Um, and then I have a variety of different lenses. I really like the, the, Nik the uh, Nikon Z 20 millimeter uh, 1.8 lens for, for night photography and landscapes. Um, I do have a, a 200 to 500 millimeter lens as well, which I, which I picked up mainly to do wildlife photography on the side. Um, but it's really grown into a powerful uh, landscape photography lens for me as well. And I'll get into that a little bit with some of the telephoto landscapes coming up. Um, but yeah, just having a, a bit of a variety of lenses and, and different, um, like the 85 millimeter I use for landscapes as well sometimes. So just, just playing around with different focal lengths and that kind of thing. 
All right, so some must-have accessory gear. Um, so, you know, something that I really, really find is really crucial is um, is neutral density filters. So we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, coming up uh, a little bit later. Um, that's for doing long exposures, controlling the light a little bit better. Um, a nice light and sturdy tripod, something like a carbon fiber tripod, um, something that's light but solid. Um, an L bracket, that was a real game changer for me. So an L bracket, fits on the, the side of your camera, the bottom of your camera, and it allows you to shoot both portrait and ori and landscape orientation with ease. Um, so you're not fiddling around with your the ball head on your tripod quite a bit. Um, so definitely having some good lighting sources, not just for safety, but for creativity as well. So, um, you know, some like a loom cube, um, uh, maybe some lighting panels, that kind of thing. Um, always make sure to change out your batteries and your, your headlamps and flashlights and that kind of thing once a year. Um, they always seem to die at the worst possible time, so so that's a little tip there. Um, and then one of the most important items for me is a good set of insulated rubber boots. Uh, this is for like standing in streams, riverbeds, uh, just to get some unique angles and get really low to that water. Um, that's probably one of the, the biggest pieces of gear that I, I really recommend to have. All right, so telephoto landscapes. Um, so here's Mist Mountain in uh, Kananaskis, Alberta. So this is seen from Highway 40, heading Highway 40 heading west from Longview. Um, so I shot this one at 200 millimeters. So shooting with telephoto lenses really adds a, a compression factor. So you're kind of really tightening up that scene, um, bringing that mountain much closer. So if you were to use a traditional wide angle lens here, that mountain would just be kind of a little, almost like a little speck in the distance. Whereas using the telephoto lens to really compress that that distance uh, really kind of gives it a little bit more oomph um, and shows that shows that mountain uh, really more much more prominently. So using a telephoto landscape or a, a, tel a telephoto lens to, to shoot landscapes, you you're able to get to places you're you're generally not physically able to get to as well. So that's quite a quite a few benefits. Um, so. Here's a 200 versus 500 millimeter on that lens. So this was the summer of smoke, we called it, back in 2018 here at Edmonton. Uh, we had some terrible wildfires in BC. Um, as you know, we're, you know, we're starting to get into fire season again. So hopefully nothing too bad this year. So, um, you know, as, as horrible as that was, I always find that the silver lining to, to that those kind of smoky and hazy skies is you do get some nice kind of like red fiery ball sunsets. Um, so th these were taken just uh, a little bit east of Edmonton. Um, so one at 200 and one at 500 meter millimeters. So you can really see the difference of um, just creating a different look just by using different focal lengths, right? So um, a lot of my favorite, a lot of my favorite focal lengths to shoot are somewhere kind of in between that. So th like 350, 400 millimeters, um, you can get some really kind of unique shots. All right, so a few more uh, examples here of, uh, of telephoto landscape photography. So three different focal lengths here. So we've got a 50 millimeter at Tangle Falls. We've got a 200 millimeter here in Jasper and a 70 millimeter out at Abraham Lake. Last year, the, the water levels were, were really, really high. So you had these really cool um, uh, aspen trees that were kind of hanging out in the water there. Um, so I had some time to, time alone at Tangle Falls last year. Um, after the first wave of the pandemic, it was, you know, it's really quiet. There hasn't been international travel. So I was able to explore a bit up and down the parkway without uh, without too much tourist traffic. Um, so it gave me a chance to play around with some different focal lengths and vantage points. Um, so yeah, the middle scene is from Jasper National Park and it just really caught my eye as the dark side of the moon kind of matched the, the dark side of the mountain. So I just waited out for an hour to, for that moon to, to kind of rise up over that and, uh, and just kind of I really like that juxtaposition of that uh, of that scene there. So, yeah. All right, and then isolating mountain peaks at sunrise. So, you know, typically um, you get a nice sunrise. You're you're you kind of naturally want to shoot that whole wide vista, that whole scene. Um, but I really like using my telephone lens to isolate just the mountain peaks themselves. Um, especially at sunrise, you get these, you know, these beautiful colors, that alpen glow on the, the mountaintops. Um, it just really makes for, for a really nice scene and you can really tighten it up with uh, a telephoto lens. All right, and then just isolating features themselves from, from wider scenes. So, you know, the shot on the left there, I did take with a wide angle lens, but for me, it just felt really 
kind of unbalanced and it was just really left heavy. Um, so instead I just, I just focused on that lone mountain off to the right. Um, and then I used a long exposure to kind of, um, to kind of, uh, give it a little bit more, more drama to the scene. Um, the, the clouds I found weren't that great for long exposure when it's kind of overcast like that and the clouds are moving really slowly, they just kind of turn into blobs. So, so I went for like a, I think it was a, a three or a five minute exposure here, a really long exposure. And it just kind of added a, a different dimension to those clouds. It kind of added more of a kind of a dreamy kind of, kind of like a, a creamy type uh, look to them, right? So I just felt that was a stronger feature in this landscape than the wide angle itself. So so don't be afraid to just zoom right in and isolate different, uh, different features of that landscape. All right, so portrait versus landscape ori orientation. So horizontal, vertical, I just tend to like the the tightened effect of vertical photography, vertical landscapes. It just has started to come become my signature style a little bit. Um, it just seems more pleasing to me. Everything is kind of tightened up and doesn't seem all over the place. Um, so I just, yeah, it just it just kind of gives me a little bit more foreground to work with, um, especially if I'm shooting in mountains or waterfalls. Um, and I think in some ways, social media has kind of influenced the way we shoot a little bit too, right? So most of our work these days is viewed on, on, on mobile devices, um, which vertical images, you know, take up almost the entire phone screen versus horizontal images are just taking, a, taking up a fraction of that screen, right? So, so um, I think that kind of influences the way we, have sh we shoot a little bit more over the last few years. Um, not that, you know, we're, we're really shooting for social media or anything, but even like when I print images, vertical images, um, I just really like the way they look. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's something I really kind of like like doing these lately. All right, so I'll get into long exposure now. So, um, long exposure is probably one of my favorite ways to kind of add a kind of a unique element to landscape photography. So, um, so using neutral density filters. So for anyone unaware of what a neutral density filter do, they're essentially a darker piece of glass that covers your lens. Um, it enables you to take a much longer exposure than normally it would without overexposing your image. Um, so some examples of filters include, there's a polarizer for removing glare off of reflective surfaces, um, regular full neutral densities help you keep your shutter open much longer, and graduated neutral densities help darken the sky while keeping your foreground more or less unaffected. Um, and there's also all kinds of niche filters for different applications like reverse ND, um, all kinds of stuff like that, right? So, you know, you can get some nice streaking clouds, you can really smooth out choppy water, um, depending on the, the strength of your, of your neutral density filter, you can, you know, go from anywhere from, you know, a couple seconds to several minutes long, right? So, so yeah, so long exposure is uh, something I, I really, I really like to do. So um, I use Nisi filters myself. Um, and I've really, I've gone through different filter manufacturers over the years. I started off with just one of the cheapest ones I could find off of Amazon or something. And it was pretty awful. Um, and then I moved on to Lee filters and I used them for a while. But you know, the original leaf filters had a bit of a, a color cast there. So I made the switch over to Nisi and I've been happy with them ever since. So um, I find having a, a variety of different ND filters for different scenarios really helpful. Um, so in some cases you might only need a polarizer or you might only need a graduated filter. Um, in some scenarios um, you might use all three. So different strengths of ND filters will give you options of, of how long of an exposure that you can do. So I used the 100 millimeter system myself. So it's basically just um, a filter holder assembly. You have a polarizer that can go right inside and you can move it while it's mounted. Um, and then I have some, just some different strengths of uh, ND filters. And I also have a natural night filter. I'll, I'll show a couple of examples of that later. Um, and then I have a couple of different grads. So the grad filters, soft versus medium versus hard, um, it all depends on what your horizon is like. So if you have just uh, like a really defined horizon edge, like um, like an ocean, for example. So that's a, a situation where you probably want to use a hard graduated filter. So it's got a, more of a, just a really sharp cutoff line versus medium and softer. They're more of a gradual uh, cutoff line between the dark and, and the light part of the filter. All right, so here's an example of a regular exposure versus a long exposure. So you can see 
you can really add on some neat effects um, all in camera just by just by using neutral density filters. So the first one there on the left is just a regular exposure at one second, F11. Um, and then I threw a 10 stop filter on there and I was able to expose for 90 seconds. Um, so it really kind of ma makes a big difference of, of how your scene looks. So, you know, these are just taken, you know, literally a couple seconds apart um, and you can, you can see quite, quite a big difference. All right, so here's another example. Uh, we've got the skyline of Toronto here when I was out east a couple years ago. Um, no filters on the on the first one there, just f8 one sixtieth per second, and then I added on a ten stop, a ten stop ND filter, and also a three stop grad, uh, just to keep that sky nice and dark. Um, so it really all depends on the look that you want to go for, um, but you can get really creative and add some, you know, get some nice cloud streaks, smooth out that choppy water. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with, with uh, long exposure images. All right, so using ND filters in, in poor weather. So this was a scene from Hay River, uh, just on the, the south side of Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories. And on this evening, I went out for sunset and it was just awful, raining, windy. It was minus nine for mid-September with, with a wind chill of, I don't know how much, but, it was it was bitterly cold and you know I really didn't want to be there, um, but I figured I'm only there for a little t little bit of time, so I want to make the most of it and try and get some images. So, um, so I yeah I, I just threw on some ND filters here to kind of smooth out that really rough water um, of the waves coming in on the shore and uh, a little bit of sunset light um, in the background there. So one thing you definitely want to make sure is you have have a nice solid tripod for situations like this. So. Um, you have to be really careful because if you are shooting a long exposure and your tripod is buried in that sand, uh, the sand might shift a little bit and give you some blurry images. So you really want to keep that nice and secure and um, not try to go like too long of an exposure. I think, uh, yeah, this one here is just 30 seconds, right? So if I would have gone into a minute, two minutes, maybe I might have had a little bit of, bit, bit more of uh, out of focus uh, kind of blur blurring there from, from that tripod shifting around. So, yeah, so just play around and, you know, even using them in great weather is, is a great, or in poor weather is a, a great way to, a great way to, to kind of make uh, lemonade out of lemons, really. So this, what are the steps I, I take for, for long exposure? So, um, so there's a little bit of a method to the madness. So first thing I want to do is determine my composition. Um, I want to select which aperture I want to use. So definitely recommend something between f8 to f14 to avoid diffraction um, to get sharper shots. So what diffraction is, um, so you've got all this light trying to come into your camera. And as you make your aperture smaller when you're getting into like the f22 area, um, it's harder for that light to kind of to kind of come in like straight on and it's kind of bending around a little bit. So that causes a little bit of softness in your shots. So um, if you can try and stick between f8 and f14. Um, and then the next thing you're going to do is you calculate your shutter speed. So you can do that by just um, if you if you don't know what your shutter speed would, would generally be, you can just throw your camera into aperture priority and it'll automatically adjust the shutter speed for you. Right. So you'll know which shutter speed to calculate over to a long exposure um, and then set your focus and throw it into manual, because as soon as you put your ND filters on there, um, it's going to try focusing and it's just going to be a dark peak piece of glass and it's going to really confuse the autofocus. So um, definitely shoot in manual focus. Um, and then, yeah, put your, put your filters on and shoot away and, and rinse and repeat um, for, for different compositions or, or if you want to try a few more with different looks. So calculating the long exposure length. So there's all kinds of apps you can get out there that are long exposure calculators. I, I like PhotoPills. Um, it's a great app for, for all kinds of purposes. Um, so it takes a lot of the guesswork on over how long to set your exposure time for. I remember when I first started out with long exposures, I didn't know anything about um, long exposure converters or calculators. So I would basically just throw my ND filter on, fire my, sh my shutter off in, in bulb mode and, and just kind of hope for the best. You know, I'd kind of guess them at like a minute or something. And sometimes it would be incredibly underexposed or incredibly overexposed. So once I started learning a bit more of how to how to translate that over to long exposure from regular exposures, it became a lot more successful. Um, so yeah, convert your, your regular short exposure time by uh, 
by adding the filter strength you're using right in the app. So I guess first I should mention um, on the, the far left uh, graphic there is the exposure setting, which is um, the second on the right uh, from the top there. And so basically in this situation, I was shooting at uh, F11, 1 15th of a second with ISO 100 um, and converting that over by the time I added my 10 stop in there, um, it became a minute and eight seconds uh, at F11 as well with my 10 stop on there. So down at the bottom there of that center graphic, you can see there's a little timer button. So once you click on that, it'll automatically put on the, the timer of uh, one minute and eight seconds, just hit start and it's automatically counting down. It'll beep when it's done. So you know when to release your shutter back. Um, so yeah, and if you're adding on a, so this just takes into account neutral density filters themselves. So if you're adding on a polarizer or uh, a graduated neutral density filter, so add a little bit of time on for each, like maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds or so, um, just to kind of, you know, you're, you're losing another extra stop or two. So, um, so yeah, just to, just to kind of compensate for that. So what types of clouds to look for? So I don't always do long exposure. You kind of almost need, you know, certain environmental situations like, you know, choppy water. Um, I like these broken kind of fast moving clouds that are, you know, have a lot of, uh, have a lot of separation from the sky uh, that gives you nice streaky shots. Um, so, and, and even solid cloud scenarios are good too. It won't necessarily show the streaking effect, but on the next slide, um, I'll, there's an example of that. So, so yeah, look for clouds that complement long exposures, not hinder them. So, you know, if you've got really slow moving clouds, they're just gonna be a blob, right? And they're, you know, I, I'd almost rather shoot a regular exposure at that point. So. So yeah, it's just something to, to kind of keep an eye on, keep an eye on the skies. All right, so yeah, so this is at, at Parksville Beach in BC. So um, again, it was a situation when I was only there for a day or two and I really wanted to get out. It was just overcast conditions in the morning. I could have easily just, you know, turned off my alarm and went back to sleep and, and slept in, but um, I wanted to get out there and make something um, just in the short time I was there. So using ND filters in overcast conditions can really help smooth out that sky and water. Um, so it takes an ordinary image into something a little bit more interesting, right? So, um, yeah, and you get a little bit of light coming through before the, the sun breaks over the, into the cloud bank. So, um, so that'll kind of light things up nicely as well. All right. So, um, polarizers. So, um, in some situations I'll just use a polarizer. So here we've got this waterfall. So, you know, looking at it just normally, um, there's some glare hitting the rocks there from a little bit of light that's coming in from the other side. So that's just, you know, a half second exposure there with no filters. And then I threw a polarizer on to, and, and rotated it to to cover up that glare on those rocks. And then I also added a, a, a graduated neutral density filter to keep the, to keep the upper part of the image uh, darker as well. So, you know, that unsightly glare can be problematic. So, so yeah, just, using a polarizer on these boulders here in the, in the foreground um, really cut down on the glare. So yeah, that's a, a good way to get rid of the glare. All right, so here's a few more examples of long exposure photography. So obviously the time of day and different filter choices are gonna make a huge difference, right? So um, so that first waterfall scene, it was, it was a beautiful sunrise at Ram Falls. Um, I threw on a six stop filter because I had these beautiful clouds streaking across over the sky uh, to get that motor motion in the clouds and uh, worked out for great for a 30 second exposure here. Um, and then the middle one was kind of more late morning, probably like three or four hours after sunrise. Um, so, you know, the light was starting to get not quite as nice, but I did have a lot of cloud cover here, which, which helped. Um, and so I was able to get a 90 second exposure uh, at that time of day. Um, and then the final one here, so um, it was a, it was late afternoon, getting a little bit close to sunset and um, a 10 stop here gave me nearly five minutes. So the lake was really choppy, it was full of waves, but by smoothing or by shooting that scene for five minutes, it really smoothed out all those, uh, all those waves. Um, and it even brought out a tiny little bit of reflection over that time as well, right? So um, yeah, so just, playing around with different filters and, and different scenarios, changing your aperture, you know, F, F8 versus F14 is, you know, 
is a few stops difference, right? So you're gonna you're definitely gonna get some different results. Um, and then just this one here. So I didn't really have any clouds in the sky at all. So um, did I even really need to use a long or uh, an ND filter here for, for anything? But I kind of liked there was all these ice flows coming down the river. So um, all these little chunks of ice were just kind of streaking on by. So I, di I did want to capture some motion from that. So I just simply used a, a 10 second exposure here with a with a six stop ND. So just little little simple things like that. All right, so the, the Nisi night filter, um, I don't use it that often. I don't shoot a lot of urban scenes anymore. I've kind of branded over to shooting just uh, mostly nature these days. Um, but here's the skyline of Vancouver. So um, what I use the, the Nisi night filter for is to kind of block out a little bit of the, the light pollution. And you, you sometimes get these uh, harsh yellow lights. Uh, I, I think they're all the old sodium vapor lights uh, before, you know, before we switched over to more LEDs. Um, so the filter will convert these to more of a pleasing orange or magenta color rather than the these kind of harsh yellows. So it's a, kind of a nice little addition to have in your bag, especially if you're shooting a lot of urban landscapes like uh, skylines and that kind of thing. So here's a, a few more a few more examples here, and that's right here in, in the city of Edmonton. So obviously the skyline has has changed so quite significantly since I took these um, a few years ago. Um, so these are a little bit older, but uh, yeah, um, just using different, uh, like the first one there, I used a six stop ND. It was uh, already had some beautiful colors at sunset, so I didn't need too strong of a filter on there. Um, and then this, the middle one there was, uh, was, was twice as long as that, so I had a 10 stop filter. Uh, the light was, uh, wasn't quite as, uh, as, as golden hourish, um, so that one ended up being uh, 120 seconds. And then 30 seconds just um, down underneath the, the Walterdale Bridge there, um, just uh, using the Nisi night filter to, to kind of block out any of those kind of harsh yellow colors uh, and give a little bit more of a pleasing image. All right, so here's some uh, short long exposures. I know that sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but for me, these are typically waterfall scenes where I want to retain some texture in the water. Um, I generally shoot these at anywhere from uh, 1 20th to 1 second because uh, I, I do want that kind of silky waterfall look but not quite um, you know overblown uh, retaining some of that texture in the water so generally for these I'll use something like a three stop ND filter um, or in some cases just a graduated ND filter so um, in the middle one there um, which is in Ontario this beautiful waterfall I used the polarizer as well um, similar like the the boulder one slide a couple a couple slides ago um, the, the leaves in the foreground there were, were really wet and shiny. So by using a, a polarizer there, it took off a little bit of that, that shine and that glare and, uh, and, um, kind of balanced out the image a bit more rather than, you know, those being the center of attention. So yeah, just playing around with different, different shutter speeds to get the look that you want. Um, you know, maybe you want to, to shoot a, a 60 second exposure to waterfall for that, that really, really nice silky look. Um, it's totally up to you. All right, so panoramic scenes. So um, so panos are, are a lot of fun to shoot. Um, I usually always shoot vertical panos. Um, so, you know, I'll shoot vertically. Like in this scene, it was a, a seven seven vertical shots to get that entire rainbow in there over this uh, over this abandoned house after, after a summer storm. Um, yeah, and then you can just stack those together in, in post-production, just in Lightroom, uh, merge them together into a, into a nice panel. Um, yeah, and it's it's a great way to um, you know add a add a different look to a scene. Um, I know I think I was shooting with a 14 millimeter lens here, and I couldn't even get the rainbow in just you know in in my single shot. So that's what you know really made me opt to uh, to shoot it as a panel. And then we've got these uh, these crazy northern lights up from up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, it was one of those nights where. The, the northern lights were every direction in the sky, north, south, east, west. It was you didn't know where to look, right? So, um, so I really wanted to kind of portray that in this scene. So, um, so I opted to shoot. This is an eleven-shot vertical pano, and you had to shoot this. It was kind of a tricky shot because obviously the northern lights are moving around quite a bit. So, so I really raised up my ISO here to capture this one um, with I think it was just one second exposures all the way across um, for those eleven shots. 
and then it, it basically captures like a, a an entire 180 um, degree field of view, right? So, um, so yeah, just playing around with different different panoramas, and then one more here. We've got this Chinook arch uh, down in southern Alberta. Um, those tend to come through quite often down there, um, and so I was going down this country road, and it was just kind of it was just kind of lining up with the road almost. You know, you had you know different crops on each side, uh, different complementary colors. So for this one, I, I shot a, a nine shot panorama, and yeah, just just merging it together. You can use Lightroom or Photoshop, um, or I'm sure there's other P, I think PTI GUI or something like that. Um, there's lots of different uh, lots of different software you can use to to stitch these panoramas together, and, it, and it's fairly easy to do. All right, so something I've really kind of focused on a bit more over this year and last year um, is intimate landscapes. So just taking little pieces of the, the landscape and just kind of, it's kind of like telephoto landscapes in a way, but just little, little scenes, um, just to kind of, you know, looking for details and that kind of thing, right? So different textures, patterns, details. Um, it adds a little bit more story from the main chaos of the grand landscape. So just looking for little smaller scenes to, to add as a component to the overall story. So here's some uh, ice triangles out on Abraham Lake one year. You get a lot of really cool uh, formations there. Um, so the bubbles, you know, tend to get a lot of the focus there, but there's all kinds of other um, little patterns and details. Um, I, I absolutely love it there in winter for for just looking around at uh, all the different ice formations out there, and you can really get some some really really cool and unique images. And then these little uh, snow pillows here, um, just yeah, just something I, I you know there was you know it was a part of a big landscape, but these snow pillows just kind of the the softness and smoothness of them, the textures just really kind of jumped out at me. So. I thought that was just kind of a nice, pleasing scene to add to the story of that day. And then we've got uh, intentional camera movement. So kind of like an abstract um, scene, you can use neutral density filters for this application as well. Um, it's generally just a matter of just, you know, moving your, your moving your camera as you're, as you're taking a shot, right? So you might do like a one or two second exposure and just kind of pan your camera down as you're taking that shot. Um, and you know you could get some really cool stuff um, by adding on neutral density filters. You can shoot even longer, like five, ten seconds, right? So, um, so yeah, you can create some really nice abstracts um, by doing that. All right, so here's a few more details in the landscape. So we've got these leaves floating um, in a pool of water uh, towards the end of fall, um, and then we've got some just some ice patterns along a creek, and then remnants of a forest fire. To me, it just resembled these these porcupine quills. Um, so just little scenes like this that are so much fun to shoot. And you know, it's like I said, it's not always about the grand landscape. It's you know just looking for little pieces of the landscape as well that can kind of really complement your photography. All right, and one more int intimate landscape here. So there was this, you know, part of a much larger forest scene, but I really liked the way the light was hitting these trees and interacting, you know, they had this beautiful hoar frost that morning. Um, so I just really kind of focused in and isolated that part of the landscape here. Um, just to, you know, once again, you know, have something kind of a bit more unique, right? So. And then, you know, another frosty morning here. This is over at the, the Natural Bridge. There's a, a time where it freezes up. Uh, I think it's like towards the end of January. There's a brief window where, you know, you can get down there and, and find some really cool patterns um, under the bridge itself. So, yeah, just looking up, like almost looking at like a, like a window into the sky here, right? So just looking for little things like that. All right, so foregrounds. Um, foregrounds and other elements. So adding foreground elements can give you your images a lot of scale and depth. Um, it gives you nice natural leading lines and anchors that that really help um, solidify a scene. Um, so this this was just a beautiful sunset uh, a bit east of Edmonton, and yeah, it was just you know I had these rocks in the foreground here to add kind of a little bit more to the image um, and add more to the story. So there's a few more examples of foreground elements here. So um, we got the, the, the lines of the road are always a great uh, natural kind of leading line um, to use. Obviously, you know, anytime you're shooting on the road, be very aware, be very safe, have a spotter to, 
look for any traffic coming from either direction. Make sure it's on a quiet road where there's hardly any traffic. Um, and then the middle photo there is uh, in Waterton National Park, these beautiful wildflowers. I think we're pretty much into the, the wildflower season right now. So um, yeah, it makes for really great and interesting foregrounds. Um, and then uh, that third image there is one from Prince Albert National Park in Saskatchewan. So um, just even some footsteps from wildlife or, or, you know, you can even make your own footsteps. Um, just to add a little bit more interest to a scene um, and add a little bit more story there. So just things to, to kind of play around with uh, when adding uh, foreground elements. Right, and then a few more examples. So, um, so I love lone trees. Um, I think they're they're just amazing uh, subjects for photography. Um, but I really like this this rock this this rock in the foreground here that was kind of anchoring it, and all these wild grasses around there. Um, it just gave the scene a little bit more life. And then, of course, I used the long exposure as well to add some drama to those clouds. Um, I think that one was a, about a minute long exposure, um, and then. Again, Abraham Lake, you, you know, some some really cool ice patterns uh, that you get out there. So that ice added a little bit more, little bit more depth to the scene. And I actually took a, I have a, a loom cube, and I took a loom cube and I just kind of stuck it in the snow there to light up that ice to, to just to give it a little bit more oomph. Um, because, you know, without that, it was just kind of, it was in the shadows. And uh, yeah, so just little things like that. And then the third scene there is uh, up at Blatchford Lake in the Northwest Territory. So um, just you're up in the Canadian Shield there. There's lichen all over the rocks and uh, it just adds a little bit more color, right? So just using that as a, a little bit of a foreground to anchor that scene um, or just some things that you can look for. And then using water as a leading line too, like rivers and waterfalls. Um, so, you know, this is where those rubber boots come in handy that I was talking about earlier, right? You can really get into these streams and, uh, uh, well, not the river there, but um, you can really get into some into some water and, and get down low and, and get some nice perspectives and, and that kind of thing, right? So so even just something as simple as, uh, as a river or, or waterfall for a leading line is, is a great way to, to get some unique images. And then, you know, there's some times where I don't like using foreground. It kind of almost kind of is too much, adds a bit too much chaos. So I like these two shots just uh, equally as much. Um, it's just a little bit of a different look to the scene. So obviously on the, the left there, I used the driftwood as, as a foreground anchor. Um, but then on the right, I kind of moved back a bit and went right down along the beach. And I just wanted to kind of capture the, the aurora um, that was kind of mimicking the curve of the of the water there. So um, so yeah, and just the simplicity of the shoreline. So it it's really up to you of how you want to portray a scene. So, you know, there there's there's arguments for foreground versus versus no foreground. The next slide I've got a few more examples of no foreground. So as you can see here, um, sometimes I just like reflections as symmetry. Um, so you know uh, I'll put my horizon right in the center and, and just go for a straight up symmetrical shot. I think those are beautiful as well. Um, they're just kind of nice and simple and pleasing to look at. Um, and, and don't be afraid to break photo traditional photography rules. So a lot of my compositions are center heavy. Um, so, you know, don't necessarily have to use the rule of thirds all the time. Um, just play around and, and, and see what you like and, and really experiment of, with different compositions. All right, so focus stacking. So, so focus stacking is a way to get your entire scene in focus, like how we would see with our eyes. So by by changing your focus point throughout the scene, um, as you can see these these four images here, um, the the mountains are are the sharpest, and the final image and the flowers, the foreground flowers are the are the the sharpest, and and the, the far left image. So I've changed my focal length at different points going through these four different images. Um, and then you can blend them together for one scene um, in Photoshop or Lightroom. So yeah, and there's there's actually a crescent moon. You can hardly see it in, in this shot uh, in, or in any of these shots just because um, you know you did, did have that kind of bright sky, right? But by, by blending these together, um, you, you'll see it in the next shot here. So you, you can see that tiny crescent moon above. So 
So this is the final result after my other post processing of you know bringing out some bringing down some highlights and bringing up some shadows and a little dodging and burning. Um, so the data from from all those files was able to give me much more information in that image, and I was a better able to control those those highlights and shadows. So um, so what's even easier now with a lot of the newer cameras, like for example the the, the Z6 that I'm using, um, it has a built built in focus shifting. So you've got focus stacking right in the camera. So the camera will do all your all the work for you. You just need to put it together in post processing. Um, so it does take a lot of the manual work out of it. You know, before we we would just be, you know, dialing that focus ring ever so much, right? And uh, and checking it. So um, so yeah, I was really inspired by um, some of the, the the fields of flowers that you see in uh, in Holland and Washington State. Um, so I was I was heading down to Vancouver to do some work in that that area at this on that particular spring. So I couldn't resist to, to check out one of the local tulip festivals. So um, I was lucky enough to get in here before the crowds arrived at sunrise. So I had a, a chance to play around um, a little bit with uh, with some different compositions and that kind of thing. All right, so close to home landscape. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, with the pandemic we've been through over the last 18 months, it's travel has been really difficult. So just finding things close to home to shoot and you're not only not only um, you know with, with not being able to travel, but you're also developing your skills for when it is time to travel, right? So um, you know you're investing time and money into travel, right? So if you know you want to get your your skills up up to par before before you you go on these kind of you know longer trips and that kind of thing, right? So we always tend to think the grass is greener on the other side. Um, for example, you know, here in Edmonton, you know, you, you think, oh, you know, you want to get out to the mountains to make great landscape images, but that's not necessarily the case. You can you can make great images close to home uh, without even going far at all, even pretty much in your own backyard. Um, so, you know, developing our skills and 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 saving that time for for when we are traveling, um, you know, time is valuable, right? So. An example of that is uh, six years ago, I was just getting back into landscape photography again, and uh, I did a, a self-driving tour in Iceland with a, with a couple of friends, and uh, the entire ring road in 10 days, um, I thought I was prepared, but I spent most of the time driving around the country, and I was trying to learn long exposure photography on the go as well, so I was, you know, experimenting with that, and, um, you know, I, I really kind of wish I'd have kind of practice long exposure before I went and and was a little bit more prepared for that right so so yeah just just finding things close to home and and really developing your skills before you go on these trips uh, um, really makes a huge difference um, so here's a few more landscape scenes just close to home just basically going out for a drive um, a foggy morning um, just here on the outskirts of Edmonton foggy and frosty um, and then a, a minimalistic kind of blue hour shot from from Elk Island National Park of High Island. Um, and then that third image there, another long exposure image. And all that was, was just, uh, it was just some meltwater from from the spring melt, uh, just on a roadside slough. So, you know, not necessarily a, a place that's a hotspot for landscape photography, but uh, you can really make great images anywhere just by, you know, just kind of looking for different, um, different conditions, like looking for water for reflections, looking, keep an eye on those clouds and how they're moving and determining if it would be a good long exposure. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of playing around with that. All right, so apps and planning. So I do try to put quite a bit of uh, time into to planning. Um, it's not always 100% accurate, um, you know, these apps with, with cloud predictors and that kind of stuff. So um, as, as Aurora chasers would know, um, you know, you, it, you'll obviously get, uh, you know, it'll say clear skies and then it'll be cloudy, right? So, but these do give you kind of a, a chance to put yourself in the best position to succeed. Um, just by using some of these apps, you'll you'll kind of get an idea of what the weather can be, right? So, um, and then just using using your phone as well as, as scouting. So just frame and composition with your phone before you even get your camera out. Um, using Google Maps to pin a location to return to, um, especially for if you want to go back and shoot somewhere in the dark, right? You're not going to find that again. It's pretty unlikely you're going to find that again if you don't if you don't pin it on Google Maps, right? So um, a lot of daytime scouting and that kind of thing. But I'll go through a couple of the apps that I like to use over the next few slides. All right, so Astrospheric, um, it's a great app. It's completely free, which is even better. Um, it predicts the cloud cover. So using this app, I can kind of look for spots on the map that will be, 
you know, around 30 to 50% cloud cover, which generally usually yields some nice sunrise or sunset light. Um, and then for night photography, you know, I can plan out locations where the, the skies will be free of clouds. Um, I also pay close attention to the dew point uh, in winter, which really helps to try, helps me to try and predict frost, those hoar frost mornings. Um, it's definitely not an exact science. There's quite a few variables that go into it. Um, but another thing about, um, about Astrospheric <clears throat> is they recently added the, the KP index, which is the, the Kensifer Planetary Index for the strength of the Aurora. So that's, you know, something that you've got in there as well. So um, just really a really cool app and a really helpful app and being free. Like, this is an app I wouldn't even mind paying for um, if it gets to that point. So um, yeah, really, really handy to have. All right. And then this is another kind of planning app. It's called the Photographer's Ephemeris, I was struggled saying that. Um, so it's a great planning tool for um, sunrises and sunset positions, uh, moon phases, different stages of twilight. So it'll tell you nautical twilight, astronomical twilight. So you can kind of, if you really want to plan specifically plan, plan blue hour shots, or you know you really want that full darkness, um, it'll give you you know those phases, right? So it also includes a light pollution map. So um, you know if you you know, you think you're in an area where there might be a bit too much light pollution. If you're going out to shoot a roar or something like that, <clears throat> you know, you can use that that interactive uh, light pollution map to kind of seek out a bit bit more of a, a better spots for a roar or Milky Way and that kind of thing. And then photo pills, we did touch that on, on that a little bit earlier with the exposure calculator app. Um, so it is similar to TPE maybe a little bit more advanced. Um, I find this app is excellent for planning Milky Way shots. It's gonna show you the position of the Milky Way, the time of night it's available or it's it's visible. Um, and then obviously, yeah, those other other features in there like the long exposure calculator, hyperfocal distance. Um, honestly, there's so much in this app that I probably don't even use 80% of it. I probably only use uh, like 20% of this app. It's It's got so much in there. So, and I think this one's, um, it's, it's not that much, it's like 10 bucks or something like that, but it's it's worth it to have for sure. Um, and then, yeah, just a few other apps here. So for for Aurora, I absolutely love Space Weather Live. I find it's the most accurate. Um, you know, it'll, it'll tell you the conditions in real time. Um, so you're not, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of Aurora and if it's even worth going out. Um, and then I do a bit of storm chasing in the summer and I like using Radar Scope for that one. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great radar app, um, that, that kind of gives you a, gives you a heads up of, of, of how to plan your chase safely. Um, Windy is another great app for cloud cover. Um, you know, different, different, uh, um, different information in that too, like precipitation or, um, or I think fogs in that one too. I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, it's got all kinds of stuff in that one too. And that on Windy is a free app as well. Um, so I, I use that also with Astrospheric as kind of a, uh, like a double confirmation of, of clear skies. So um, the, the more apps you can you can use to, to plan clear skies, the better, right? Because it's, it's pretty, um, pretty regular that one of them is wrong. Um, so yeah, and then again, Google Maps, great for pinning locations to, or even scouting. Um, like I'll go in Google Maps satellite view to, to plan out photography shoots, right? Looking at, you know, maybe this corner of this lake might yield some really great light or some nice compositions, just way, the way trees look on, on satellite maps or, or whatever, right? So, um, so yeah, just using, using some of those apps to your advantage. All right, so like I said, I do a little bit of storm chasing in the summer. So using severe weather in your landscape photography as well. So just learning a little bit about the weather. So you don't need to be a meteorologist or anything, but just some simple skills, identifying potential severe weather or cloud types uh, can give you some really nice dramatic images, right? So um, so just getting out there and um, and getting out with this severe weather, you know, obviously safety is your number one priority. So I would definitely learn uh, learn a bit about maybe take some spotting courses. There's some online um, just to just to kind of make sure you're you're kind of ready to go. So um, with severe weather, what I did is is many years ago, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I jumped out there and it was probably really dangerous. Nothing bad came out of course, but um, just just wasn't quite prepared and. So the next summer, I just took the entire summer off of, of severe weather chasing and I just really learned 
about the different cloud types and the different scenarios, different, uh, you know, how to read some weather models and, and that kind of stuff, right? Just to kind of uh, get myself a bit, bit better prepared. So yeah, and then you can even, even in some situations when you're shooting severe weather, you can use neutral density filters, right? So so I think in this one here, I used a, a graduated neutral density filter to help darken that sky a bit, um, just so it wasn't overexposed um, with the sky because trying to capture that lightning is, is, is so quick, right? So you kind of want to really have a kind of underexpose a little bit for lightning. Um, and then here's something I like to call image yield. Um, so image yield um, is something I, I kind of came up with trying to get as many shots as you can out of, you know, out of a golden era. So, um, oh, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're traveling a lot. Maybe we're going to the mountains for a weekend or, or something like that. So tr trying to get as many usable shots out of those trips as you can to make the trip worth it. Right. So, um, so just kind of moving around. Um, so, um getting as many usual shots as you can from from one location and one golden hour um so these three scenes were all shot a half hour apart and are all about a five minute walk from each other and you can see they're three completely different looking images um so that first one there you know i had the sun behind me it was lighting up those trees beautifully just in front of the, the miette range there in jasper um and then i think for the, the next one there half hour later i just basically walked across the highway um, and found uh, just this kind of little pond um, as the sun was setting itself and was able to get a nice sunburst out of that. And then a half hour after that, I went a bit further up the road and I found another little kind of lake. I think it's actually run off from the Athabasca River and um, just had that kind of nice afterglow. Uh, you get those nice kind of lingering sunsets at this time of year. Um, yeah, and just, you know, just working different compositions for, for um, to, to maximize that image yield. Um, so, you know, just trying not to stay stationary. I think it's easy to fall into that trap of, you know, finding a great composition and just staying there the entire golden hour, right? So, um, you know, you're gonna get, you're gonna get a great image probably, um, but at the same time, you're pretty much only gonna have that one composition, that one image, right? So just, you know, it's it's fine to give up on a, on a composition and, and move somewhere else and, and look for something else uh, as the light's changing. So here's another example of, of image yield. Um, so I've actually got five shots here. There's there's uh, two more in the next slide. But um, so this was a chilly October, October morning last fall in uh, in Jasper along the Athabasca River. Um, and I was just walking up and down the river. It gave me so many different options. Um, I knew it was going to be a mostly cloudless sunrise just looking at the astrospheric app. Um, so I wanted to find a location where the sun is going to be rising up behind me. Um, so yeah, so I found this spot along the Athabasca River. The sun was behind me the entire time. Um, and yeah, I was able to, to catch the, the Alpen glow hitting those peaks there and just finding different, different, uh, foreground compositions with the river. And then the final two images, um, I just went up to Athabasca Falls, like about a 20 minute drive from the first location. Um, and again, I, I, I had this feeling that, uh, just by looking at astrospheric that there, there might be, you know, the, the sun might hit the mist on the mist plume on the falls. Um, so it did, and it only lasted 30 seconds, but, uh, but uh, yeah, having that sunlight come through the trees and, and light the mist, I think that's one of my favorite images of, of last year. Um, so just, just being prepared for that. And uh, I ended up shooting, a, I think it was a three or a five shot bracket here, just to, just to, to compensate for the highlights and the shadows. Um, and uh and yeah and, and it worked out well so so just this one particular morning and i got five images i was really happy with just by moving around um if i'd have stayed in that same spot um for the entire golden hour you know i might have only gotten one image right so so it's just a, a matter of kind of moving around a little bit not being afraid to leave your composition and, and find a new one um and just uh yeah just experimenting Right, so icons, popular locations. So uh, I think you know many of us as landscape photographers, we start out shooting these these iconic popular locations. We're inspired by ease of access and and the familiar familiarity of social media inspiration uh, and the draw factor. Right, so um, I think over time you kind of gradually shoot these less and less um, and kind of look for new things to shoot, um, but. These are also great for if you're just visiting a place, like if you're coming from Ontario to to Alberta, to, you know, you might only be have one 
trip of a lifetime to the mountains, right? So, um, so shooting these are, are great for, for visiting places and that kind of thing, but just for trying to find unique, um, unique conditions, right? So with this scene here at Two Jack Lake, it was a, it was a January, it was a really mild January afternoon. And a lot of the, the ice was kind of melting a little bit on top of the lake and adding, a, adding some puddles of water to, to use as reflections. And we had this, you know, it was warm. So we had this beautiful Chinook arch uh, cloud system going overhead. And uh, yeah, kind of added kind of uh, some unique, a neat, unique look to this. All right, so, and then here's some more um, popular location here, uh, the, the Three Sisters Mountains. Uh, that scene always tends to steal the show here, um, but just moving a little bit to my left, uh, where the sun was actually coming up, um, it, you know, it made kind of a unique image here with these trees reflecting, right? So so just kind of, um, yeah, just, just moving around um, at, at these icons and, and finding different compositions. So here's uh, three popular spots with some unique takes. Um, so I actually shot all three of these um, five years ago in 2016. Um, and uh, Emerald Lake there, the first one. So it was blue hour just after sunset. That, this was actually an accidental image and it ended up being one of the favorite, my favorite images I've ever shot. I was shooting a bit further down the shoreline um, and I was just, you know, sunset finished up. It was nothing too special. And uh, I was walking back to my vehicle and I, I just out of the corner of my eye, I saw this kind of this driftwood uh, log that was kind of in the water there. And I figured, oh, I'll just go down and check that out. And I ended up taking one shot here, um, you know, the blue hour, the lights are starting to come on the cilantro cafe there, Mount Burgess, you know, looking beautiful in the background. Um, and this was a long exposure as well. Um, the water wasn't perfectly smooth. So I think I shot a 20 or 30 second exposure and it ended up being one of my favorite images I've ever shot. So, um, and then, yeah, just uh, Vermilion Lakes is a, a really popular sunrise uh, location. So you get some really unique sunsets there. So using a long exposure here as the, as the light is, is coming up over Rundle there. Um, and then just, you know, I got some foreground grasses there that, are, that have a bit of movement to them as well. Um, and then Moraine Lake. So Moraine Lake, unless you're, unless you're hiking in there or, or biking in there or, or skiing in there, um, you know, during the winter, it's, it's, you don't often get uh, snowy conditions there. So, so just looking for unique uh, conditions at some of these icons to kind of set your images apart. Um, we'll, we'll kind of make them stand out a little bit more than, you know, the, the tens of thousands of images we see coming out of some of these places. Um, so external lighting. So using artificial lighting um, at night, for, for added effect, right? So I'll use like a light panel or a loom cube. To, it'll help complement that scene and light up the foreground and add a little bit more depth to it. Um, so, you know, you can light paint with your headlamp or flashlight. Um, I do find the light on those a little bit too harsh. So I really like that kind of LED low level lighting, um, which is, adds kind of a really kind of a soft ambient light, uh, which really helps for those nighttime long exposures. So yeah, just playing around with, with lighting um, for night scenes can, can make a huge difference, right? So, and here, here's another one. Um, I was out with a photographer and this night and we, we used, we each used a light panel on each side, um, to kind of balance out that scene a little bit. So, um, yeah, you just had this abandoned homestead with the, the Milky Way there, um, just, just lined up nicely and perfect there. And, uh, you know, your typical spring Milky Way with all that, that dead brown grass, I kind of like it in a way, um, that, that kind of, uh, just a nice prairie look. Right. So, so yeah, I usually just keep an led panel or two in, in my, in my camera bag for, for situations like this. And then here's an Aurora shot from, from several years ago. So, uh, this old abandoned car out, out in a, you know, just at the beginning of a field here. And, um, there was a lot of moonlight on this night as well, which really helped brighten up that scene, but the car was still a little bit, little bit silhouetted. So I just used a, at that time I didn't have any panels or anything. So I just used a, a quick, really quick flashlight here to, to kind of light paint the car a little bit as well. And then the, 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 the hoodoos at Drumheller. Um, so again, um, I was out with another photographer friend this night and we both used uh, lighting panels here to light up this scene. Um, you can see that sediment and that those layers of rock there um, just, you know, in the hoodoos, right? So, you know, if we hadn't used uh, light panels here, it would generally, they would probably generally just be silhouettes as well. So I just think it adds a little bit more interest to the scene if you can use some, 
some artificial lighting in your night shots to kind of complement them. And then post-processing, obviously, you know, you can put your own unique spin uh, on your photography the way you post-process, right? There's no harder or fast rule when it comes to post-processing. I mean, it's it's all personal flavor, right? So um, I, I don't really like, you know, presets or sky swaps or anything like that. I, I just like kind of leave, leaving things really natural. Um, that's just my own ethical values. I don't have any problems with them at all. Um, so yeah, I just, I just want to kind of represent things the way I saw them. Um, but yeah, using, you know, um, so I use Lightroom Photoshop and um, Topaz Denoise is, uh, you know, it, it's been a game changer for me, especially for a lot of high ISO images with, uh, especially with wildlife, low light, that kind of thing. Um, and then I use the, the, the Nick collection, um, mostly Color FX Pro for a couple of little, uh, little tweaks here and there sometimes. Um, yeah. And uh, th those are a few of the post-processing programs that I use. All right, and then ethics and character. So, you know, just, it's all about just having respect for the landscape and keeping things clean. Um, just, just you know, if you break an ND filter, for example, rather than, you know, clean up all that broken glass rather than leaving it there, you know, that's, it's, it should just go without saying, right? There's There's been so many times when I've been out shooting a scene and there's, you know, little things like uh, like broken glass or, or plastic wrappers that that others have left behind. It's just kind of a little bit frustrating, right? So, um, so I do have a, a list of a code of ethics on my website. It helps keep me accountable, um, and and others I'm out with, right? So you know, it's just about respect. Um, be aware of the weather conditions. It's easy to get caught out in a storm, especially if you're in the mountains. The weather's changing all the time. Um, be respectful of others, uh, photographers, non-photographers, hikers. You know, everyone's out there to enjoy and share the same space. So, um, or better yet, don't go to a, a location that's busy. Like, don't go to Moraine Lake at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, just find out, seek out some places um, and go. You know, at those early, uh, early golden hours or, or late sunsets, um, and uh, you'll, you'll find there's a lot less people there, right? So, um, and then. Last thing is, it's just night photography. Edit. So watch your light at night. You're out shooting with other photographers. You know, if you're constantly flicking on your headlamp or your flashlight or anything like that, you know, you're really going to impact their shots because of how sensitive the, the images are to the to the light at night, right? So just having a little bit of etiquette and, and respect um, really just goes a long way. Um, and then, yeah, so, you know, don't trespass on the private property uh, to get shot. So there's a lot of rural crime right now, right? So a lot of landowners and property owners are, are on edge. Um, some landowners really don't mind you shooting on their, your property um, as long as they know ahead of about a time. You know, you can you can trade with them like a, a print uh, to let me to let me shoot here one night or something. Um, so, yeah, and, and be active and friendly on social media. Um, any criticism will help you become a better photographer. Um, so yeah, and develop and stand by a code of ethics to hold yourself accountable and others. Um, never stop learning. Don't become complacent and, you know, build your work and sort it into collections over time. And yeah, that wraps up the presentation here. We're pretty much uh, an hour in. Um, so yeah, those are my my social channels there. I'm at Marching's Photo on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, there's my website there. Um, I'm, I haven't done any workshops or tours over the last uh, over the last uh, 18 months or so with with uh, the COVID pandemic. So I'm hoping to get some some more launched a little bit later this year. Um, and yeah, you, you know, you're welcome to reach out. Uh, my email's on there if you have any questions or anything, but um, yeah, I'm going to end this presentation now, come back into, into the, the chat here and, uh, and take some questions. Great information, Mark. That was, that was uh, very informative and I love your code of ethics because uh, like you said, we got to re respect the environment and uh, cause we're only a feature in it ourselves. So um, exactly. we don't, thank you. And uh, I'd like to introduce Jim from Nisi. He's been answering quite a few questions on the chat. Uh, he's actually beat me to quite a few of the answers. So uh, thumbs up to you. <laughs> um, you're just a better typer than I am, I think. Um, I'm going to start the questions off because Rob and Sebastian here, and I accidentally popped this up in the middle of your presentation. I do apologize to both oh, Robin and Mark. And uh, <laughs> um, 
but uh, it was regarding you know the Milky Way and the and the polar axe or parallax parallax. Okay. Uh, Milky Way, Milky Way, four row pano around. So parallax. Um, so I'm not actually really that familiar with parallax. Is that um, the like the kind of like the sense of scale of? Um, um, if you'll allow me to pipe in. Oh sure, go ahead, Jim. It's um, and Robin's been asking uh, quite a few questions about this, but sure. the parallax is when you um, what what you're looking at. Or what the camera's looking at, uh, and how that's a different perspective from the, the from the position that, for example, oh, uh, I'm doing a great job, aren't I? I should have kept my mouth shut. If you if you if you turn a camera for a panorama, and you're not turning it on the focal node, as you turn different distances in the image will not line up perfectly. Right. If okay. You, if you can rotate the camera on the focal node, and what the focal node actually means is it's that it's that spot in the lens where uh, light rays actually intersect. And then you get the, you know, like the, you take the picture of the apple and then the apple goes through the lens and it's an upside down reversed apple on the, uh, on the focal plane, on the, where the film or where the sensor is. Okay. So that, that's the focal node. If you can actually turn the camera on the focal node while doing the panoramic, your your uh, images will line up perfectly. But if you don't, if you basically mount the camera on the tripod and have the lens out in front of it and you're turning it in sort of a sweeping manner, then what will happen is, is as you're turning, You'll you'll have different points of of um, intersection as you're turning as you're turning the lens. And what I answered Robin in, in the thread was is that software seems to take care of that pretty well. Mm -hmm. If you put uh, four or five images into Lightroom and say you want to stitch them together, it will actually skew the images so that the images will line up. But right. if you're a perfectionist. You want to turn on the focal node because then your, sure. then your, then your, um, uh, capturing each image exactly next to each other at each time. Right. Yeah. That makes some sense. And honestly, with a lot of mine, I've I've done, I haven't really done that. I've just kind of almost winged it in a way, um, just you know, shifting my tripod, compensating a little bit, and trying to keep that horizon straight. Um, and then, yeah, just relying on Lightroom or, or Photoshop to kind of stitch that together um, yeah, there, manually. The use of a, the use of a gimbal, especially a gimbal that you can uh, shift the um, the vertical backwards, so that you can so that you can get to the center of the uh, lens, and that again is also somewhat of an approximation. I mean, if you were doing it scientifically, you would have to know, like, you would have to measure, say, a uh, an 80 millimeter lens, you'd have to figure out where the focal plane is, where the, where the sensor is, and then measure out 70 millimeters because that's where the focal node would be. Right. It's, it's, you know, there are all sorts of photographers. There are photographers that wing it, and there are photographers that are super technical. For and sure. it, really is, um, it really is a matter of just, you know, how you want to approach photography and how exacting you want to be. Yeah, but really, if the final image looks beautiful, it looks beautiful. For sure. I want to say something before the next question is asked. I do a lot of webinars, and Mark, you, your presentation is wonderful. You'll probably hear a lot of that from the people that view. Oh, thanks, Jim. It's I appreciate wonderful, that. and your images are wonderful. And um, you know, if our product had anything to do with that. <laughs> I'm really proud that we, uh, oh, that we yeah, have well, you in our Yeah, the, the filters are, are amazing, right? So they definitely help, and, and thank you for those kind words, for sure. Yeah, thank there's been a lot of kind words uh, about your presentation, Mark, so you've done a great job tonight. Great, great to hear. Um, yeah, and uh, so our next uh, question is from Leslie here, and make sure, did I pop it up? Okay. 
I would say probably, hmm, am I using ND filters in all most of these photos? I would say probably out of the photos in that slideshow, probably I would say about 60% um, are used with ND filters. Maybe a little bit more, 60 to 70%. So not always, um, but in a lot of situations, yes. And then DB has actually a couple of questions here, and this is the first one. Okay, so the, the LED light panels I use, so I've got a couple different kinds. Um, I believe one is called Generex or something like that. I, I can't remember the exact brand name. Um, I did get it from B&H Photo. And I also use some from um, LumCube. Uh, LumCube has their own LED light panels now. Um, and I believe Nisi also has some some light panels now uh, that are coming out. Oh, I'm so market. happy you said that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, Nisi Filters is the subsidiary of um, that that sells that sells to McBain's, and we have a new brand called Explorer Photo and Video, and there are some really incredible light panels. And I've already mentioned to the president of the company we need to get some uh, we need to get something going for some light panels, but that's to come soon. Good oh, I'd love to test those out on any of these uh, uh, presentations that we're having. That's for sure. There you go. I, yeah. you know, my big, my big say in this whole thing is, is to mention once again. I mentioned it on chat that um, along in, in in support of Mark doing this um, presentation, we're also running a sale in conjunction with uh, McBain's where uh, the entire Nisi range uh, is on sale for 15% off. So any filters, any filter holders, anything in the catalog that we have that in McBain sells everything that we sell, if you buy it between now and I believe the end of the week, but you guys will put out an email about it, you can get 15% off. And our stuff rarely goes on sale. So, and especially in Canada, especially in Canada. And McBain's is our only representative in Canada at this time. And um, we have a, a wonderful relationship. The manager of the main store, Renee, is a fantastic guy. Uh, the whole crew, everyone I've ever worked with at McBain's, they really, they not only are in the photography business, but they love the photography business. Well, we all shoot something different. Um, DB's second question here is regarding the light panels as well and whether or not you use gels on them. Yeah, I, I don't use any gels on the light panels, but uh, occasionally um, we'll use them on loom cubes, um, some of the different warming gels and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it's very rare. Um, I just I just like that the kind of like the natural kind of light. Um, the, the thing that I'm more concerned about is the white balance of the light. So you know, using either a cold or, or warm white balance um, throughout that range, right, to, to see which works best with the scene. Nice. Um, Cheyenne, or Shane, sorry, um, has a question regarding um, when you're on a budget and whether uh, variables are, are good to go. Absolutely. So personally, I don't really like variables. Um, and that's probably just based on my experience. So when I when I first you know was starting to use ND filters, like I said, I got some of the most the cheapest ones off of Amazon. It was you know they're pretty much crap, um, and they left really weird artifacts. Um, just and I think it was just because Is that the, the X. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think just because the, the variable filters are kind of struggling to, to to cover so many different ranges, right? So. Um, personally, I like using standalone filters. Um, if you know, if, if I do have a budget and I only want to get one filter, I probably go with something like a ten stop, which is what I use in, in probably, you know, most eighty percent of the eighty percent of situations for long exposure. Um, so, but having said that, you know, a lot of a lot of um, big uh, companies like Nisi are making variable filters now, and I'm sure they've improved a, a, a ton since since I was using yeah. them. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you very, very honestly. First of all, uh, someone had asked about if I was going to buy one filter, was it I buy? You say a ten. I would say a six is very versatile. But you know, you know, cicada, cicada. <laughs> um, and the variables, the variables are great, but I would always go to a 
specialized filter, go 16 or 10 or six or three. And we actually have in-betweens as well. And I would also always like, for example, if you want to do a 10 stop, but you've got a three and a six, I'll just stack them and I'll get nine. It's good and our filters are good enough not to uh, affect the quality uh, tremendously, but a 10 is better than say, potentially a six stop and a four stop. The less, la you know, as good as our glass is, the less layers of glass, the better. Uh, the, the variables, really the variables are best, best served by uh, filmmakers or video makers because they allow you to keep, um, they allow you to keep the, um, the depth of field or the lack of depth of field steady as you go from one scene to the other. As far as still photography goes, they're a very good solution, but the actual stepped ND at a certain uh, measurement, you know, the 10 or the six or the three or whatever is really the better way to go. For sure. And Corey here had a quick question about uh, wildlife. Uh, wildlife. In your... Cutting myself off from wildlife. Um, so yeah, I did have uh, one situation several years ago um, with an elk. Um, so I, I think elk are probably the most dangerous wildlife out there um, in the mountain parks. Um, so I was shooting a, a landscape scene. I think it was at Patricia Lake or Pyramid Lake in, in Jasper. Um, and it, it was a good lesson learned. I, I, was, I was shooting a scene, I had my bear spray, I had all my gear with me. Um, and then I figured I was done. I went back up to my car and uh, put all, started putting all my stuff away. And I just quickly looked down towards the lake and out of the corner of my eye, I saw um, another composition that looked really good. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna just quickly run out and shoot that. So I only brought my camera and tripod with me and my filters and I left everything else in the car. I forgot my bear spray and I was sitting there and I got set up with this new composition. I was shooting it and all of a sudden I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I was like, oh, great. And I reached my bear spray and I was like, ah, Okay, it's in the car. This is not good. And an elk, a, a young elk, actually came, kind of walked through and walked right up to me. And so I picked up my tripod and started walking away. And the elk ran and cut me off. Um, so I started walking the other way, and the elk ran and cut me off. And it was almost like kind of in the lake itself. So I, I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, you know, you're, you're prepared for for potential encounters with bears or something, but you never really think about an elk. Um, so I, I basically just kind of picked up my tripod and went Rawr, and, you know, <laughs> tried to make myself look as, as big as possible. I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but it did kind of make the elk kind of whinny back a little bit. And uh, it gave me a, enough of a chance to confuse it, to, to get out and back back onto the road to the, to the safety of my car, right? So um, so that's probably about the most dangerous uh, situation I've been in with wildlife. But for the most part... Um, I, th I think I, I try to make a lot of noise out on the trails and that kind of thing, and that that kind of keeps you uh, keeps the keeps the big bad wildlife away for sure. That's good information to have because you don't want to become lunch. <laughs> um, we have a quick question from Sherwin um, regarding one of your specific photos. Hey Sherwin, yeah, great question. So um, so that was last fall. Um, so I think September or so, so I was down there just doing some fall colors. Um, so yeah, and it was just, I, I don't think I, and in stark contrast, I actually just drove by Abraham Lake a couple days ago and it's, it's the lowest I've ever seen. Um, so, so yeah, quite a difference from, from last fall to, to the spring here, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's when it was. So I think the fall, maybe, I, I don't know if it's something to do with the dam there, um, uh, but, uh, the, the water levels seem to be a bit higher there for sure. Um, DB had one more question here. Um, it was again against a specific photo. Oh yeah, okay, I remember that one. Um, so that standalone tree was actually near um, Brooks, I think. It was it was just on a back road near Brooks. I think it was um, Gem was the, the closest little community. Um, but I find that down in, in that area of Alberta, there there is quite a few uh, stand standalone trees. They really stick out like a sore thumb on the landscape because it is kind of. Uh, you know, a lot of grassland and, and not very, not very foresty around there. So yeah, so that's where that was. Thanks. And Shane had another question regarding this. And I think any, any of us could uh, pretty much yeah. answer this. 
For sure, yeah. So, so yeah, that is that is one kind of situation you run into um, with long exposures and smaller sensors. Um, you get a lot of uh, hot pixels, um, they they call them. So you'll get a lot of little uh, red or, or blue spots in your in your final image, especially if you're shooting really long exposures. Um, so something you can do to that, there is a there's a filter in Photoshop. I think it's called Scratches or Scratch Repair or something like that. Um, and one of the filters there, and that should take um, by applying that, it should take a lot of those out. Um, but um, I mean, you can use um, some. You can use the in-camera noise reduction. Um, I don't like using that myself, just because it duplicates the the, the shot that you're taking that amount of time. So you've got a lot of uh, downtime in between shooting. Um, but um, or even taking a, a black frame, and, and and that kind of helps sometimes as well when blending it with that. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of little things like you can do like that, but. Uh, but yeah, um, and another thing, if you if you are getting a lot of noise, you can use a, a software program like Topaz Denoise AI, which is which is really good for removing noise. And uh, Laura here, she has a nice question. Big netting? No, I I don't actually. I've never ran into big netting. Um, I think because I'll, I'll actually show you the. I'm not using any kind of uh, screw on filters. I'm actually using, um, so you, you can see it there. I'm using the, the 100 millimeter system here. Um, so it's got these drop in filters that you can just actually slide in and out. Um, so that covers basically the entire, the entire range of your shooting. So I find that sometimes on those, those screw on filters, you might get a little bit netting if it's maybe not applied correctly, or if it's, um, you know, if you're, Maybe uh, some of the other situations, like um, maybe yeah, it's it's not on there quite right, or maybe you're using um, a filter that doesn't have uh, the right the right profile in Lightroom or something like that. Um, but for the most part, I never really run into any vignetting. I did on those original Amazon filters that I that I got years and years ago. Um, so. But that's, I know that's um, with my own shooting, I ran into that myself and. Um, one of the filters that I have at the time it was a variable. Um, it was a, like a thick um, round um, on it. And I found it was because of that. Um, I had to go with a basically uh, almost like a step up ring to a, a larger size filter and a thinner right. one to avoid that vignetting from showing up in the corners of the, uh, the images. But a commercial is going to step in here too and say that uh, one of the things about Nisi is we're very we're very aware of the uh, importance of ultra wide lenses in photography. So first of all, uh, the V6 that Mark alluded to uh, is designed so it will not uh, vignette on any lens down to 16 millimeter um, on a full frame camera and. That, that is very, very, very specifically our design. Uh, then we have larger filter solutions for ultra wide lenses with bulbous front elements. And uh, our circular filters, virtually all of our circular filters are ultra thin uh, rings for, for wide angle lenses. And our variable uh, ND, which I mentioned before, actually, um, actually enlarges it has a larger glass front so for example when you um you know in a lot of lenses on a lot of lens filters that screw in if you have a 55 millimeter and you screw in a 55 millimeter filter the front of it will still be 55 millimeter but on our variable mds they step up one size so that we don't get vignetting on on wide angle lenses so Nisi, Nisi keeps that phenomenon to a minimum. Nice, nice. Um, Corey actually here had a, a really good question. Um, okay. So, um, okay, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's just a matter of practice, right? Um, time wise, I think I really don't consider myself a pro. At this time, I think I'm still constantly learning. Um, still, that that learning curve is still ongoing, right? So, um, you know, so I, I think 
little gradual increments over year by year. Um, yeah, I know it's it's kind of it's kind of frustrating because you kind of want to get to that end goal, right? But I think just kind of almost celebrating that. Like if, if I look back at my my photos from three or four years ago, in seminar, I was like, I'll look like, oh, what was I thinking, kind of thing, right? But and and that, that kind of gives you a little bit of satisfaction that you are kind of learning um, as you're going. Um, but I would say just practice. That's all you can do. Um, trial and error is is huge, right? Um, get out together with other photographers and, and you know, and, and, and always have a conversation going, um, you know, learn what works for them. And maybe you can incorporate some of that workflow into your, into your photography, right? Uh, too as well. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, I think anyone will have like kind of a longer learning curve. There's no kind of quick magic solution to, to kind of, you know, get to a level where, where you're happy. Um, so you know it's, it's just a it's just a a constant thing um ongoing over time but just know that you're always making progress right so no matter what you do as long as you're you're continuing to embrace knowledge and learning and that kind of thing watching some youtube tutorials or that kind of thing as well workshops yeah for sure workshops it's a it's a yeah. lot of fun and it's a learning experience you will get better by going to a workshop absolutely yeah, you're taking the knowledge that you're learning either from conversation or workshops and making it yours, um, getting your basically your style. And and your networking. And um, from a business standpoint, probably the thing that makes uh, most people successful in business is by developing a network of people that can help you and bring you forward and support you and lift you up. Sure, and of course, any of our customers, even those who have never stepped foot in our store, if you guys have questions, feel free to stop by at any one of our locations or email us. We're more than happy to answer those questions. As I mentioned earlier, we all shoot, um, and we all shoot something different, and we all shoot different styles. So, you're more than welcome to share that knowledge with you guys. Um, did we have any other questions coming in? Um, Corey so was the last one here a few moments ago. And uh, if uh, there's nothing else coming out, I guess uh, I won't be able to hold you gentlemen hostage for the evening anymore. <laughs> um, uh, if, any, if, if any do questions do come up, um, you know, after this, um, feel free to reach out, email me, um, hit me up on social media. Um, you know, email is probably best, but uh, you know, you can always get a hold of me through through my website or, or um, you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, right? So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And same thing with uh, anyone here at Meg McBain through our website, emails in store by phone. You know, I can track someone down, and we'll be more than happy to help you out. McBain's is a great representative of our of our product, so reach out to them. And uh, you can do a chat or contact us through nisioptics.usa.com. And thank you. I really appreciate it, Mark. I really appreciate your presentation. Sean, I appreciate how McBain supports and uh, helps us grow as a company. And uh, I thank you very much. And I guess I'm going to say good night. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Jim, because I know you're uh, you're an hour behind us in time, so you you still only have it as seven thirty. But uh, we'll let you get through to your evening and enjoy the rest of it. And uh, Mark and I will stay up here in the sweltering heat and hopefully not melt. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. Thank you Thanks, very Jim. Much. And, Thanks, uh, Jim. Be in touch with you guys, both of you. Bye bye. Sounds, Sounds good. good. And uh, yeah, big thanks to you, Sean, as well, for, for having me on. Um, and thanks to everyone for watching. I know, like I said, summers are short and, you know, sacrificing an evening to watch this. I'm really grateful for that. And, uh, you know, there's the, I think there's an hour and a half still till sunset. So if, if anyone wants to get out there and get, get shooting, you know, you've still got some time. For sure. Um, well, I appreciate you taking the evening on a year or the sometime out of your evening to to um, come on and uh, entertain us with your um, knowledge and uh, giving us inspiration because I know through the whole entire week of uh, presentations we have my mind is like 
okay, I want to go, I want to go shoot. You know, I got the itchy, <laughs> I, I got the itchy shutter yeah. finger and, and all that. So for sure, you know, great to hear. And I'm, I was happy, happy to be here. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And hopefully we talk to you soon and, uh, I guess happy shooting and look forward to seeing your images. You too. Thank you. All right. Good night, Mark. Right. Good night. And thanks everyone. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Mark uh, joining us tonight. Um, I really look forward to any feedback that you guys all have. I'm really glad it seems like everyone in the comments has been uh, uh, really enjoying um, our landscape month and uh, we've had some great presenters uh, with Paul Ziska, Dave Brosha, uh, Mark Jenks, and uh, we had Monica Divia with uh, Nikon on Monday. So it's been basically an all-star lineup, which I've had the privilege to being part of. So um, I hope you uh, enjoy the next ones that we have uh, getting lined up for you, and uh, we'll see you on our next uh, broadcast. Have a good evening, everyone.